forest land of Missouri features some of the finest oak, walnut, pine, and red cedar trees anywhere. But the forests we enjoy today are very different from the forest a century ago. Hi, and welcome to Missouri Outdoors. I'm Kip Woods. On today's show, we're going to turn back the hands of time to an era when intense manual labor and animal-powered wagons were the norm. Missouri was in the midst of a logging boom, one that would have a lasting impact on the lives and the landscape of the region. It's a time that will not soon be forgotten by those that work the timber. Missouri's great forests cover about a third of the state, mainly in the Ozarks. The character of this land, its wildlife, its recreation, its water and wood resources, depends on the trees. It's been that way for more than a century. Though the rivers flow quietly through wooded hills today, they were the sites of great activity in the early 1900s. Railroad ties and lumber produced in this region helped develop the nation. The old motion picture footage that follows was taken in the 1920s and gives us a rare look at a fascinating part of the Ozarks past when forests covered two-thirds of the state. This is the story of the railroad cross tie from tree to track. All of the operations shown are of and by the T.J. Moss Tie Company of St. Louis that was founded in 1879. In 1888, the company was the largest supplier of railroad ties in Missouri. It was acquired by Kerr McGee Corporation in 1963. Its operations continue today. Working this virgin timber into lumber and ties put cash money into the Ozark economy. Without the logging industry, economic development of this region probably would have been greatly delayed. It all began with the felling of the tree. A logger cut a notch on the side towards which he wanted the tree to fall. The cut was then completed with a two-man crosscut saw. It was a dangerous process. Trees could fall in an unexpected direction or spring back when they hit the ground. After the tree was down, limbs and branches were removed and the log cut into eight-foot lengths since eight foot was the standard length of a railroad cross tie. Red and white oak were the preferred species, but other hardwoods were also used. I've cut lots of logs with a cross-cut saw for 10 cents a log. Well, I kind of liked it, but it was hard work and, and everything. But that's about all I ever done, was just working the timber. They just always done that, and it's what they wanted to do, they liked to do it. Cross ties were manufactured by one of two methods, either by hand hewing or by sawing. A person who hewed ties was called a tie hacker. He stood on top of the log and scored along its edges at intervals of four to eight inches. The scores, or juggles as they were called, were popped out and the faces hewn down to the desired width and smoothness with a broad ax. When they got together, they, they talked about what, how many they could do. There was competition in that. They would, uh, would actually take pride in the number of ties they could hew in a day and how smooth they were and so forth. You couldn't get in a big hurry. You just had to you just work at it. And uh, it, it, it was hard work, all right. The more you cut, the more money you got, and that's the way we done it. Well, it's hard work. We made ties there back in the late 20s and all through the 30s. It wasn't worth much, but that's all the we, source we had to make them a living. And there just wasn't much else to do except timber and make a garden and farm a little. That's, that's all I knowed. With larger logs, a hacker could obtain two ties by splitting the log with a broad axe and iron wedges. Ties were not considered well-hewn if the score marks were more than half an inch deep or the surfaces were uneven. After the two ties were split, 
the fourth side of the tie was smoothed with a broad axe. It took about an hour to hew a tie. Hackers earned 10 cents for each tie produced. A good hacker on an average day could complete about eight ties. Many farmers were able to earn extra money during the winter by hewing ties. The company had 40 sawmills operating on a 36,000 acre tract in Reynolds County. Logs were brought in from the woods on wagons pulled by teams of mules. At the sawmill, the logs were unloaded and stacked into log decks to await processing. The men used cant hooks to move the logs. The hook on the long handle gave them the leverage to roll large logs. Unlike other lumber companies in the area which had one large sawmill, the T.J. Moss Company had many small mills. Those mills helped them cut the costs of building miles of tram lines that would have been needed to haul logs to a centralized location. Most of the logs were made into cross ties, but some would be sawn into grade lumber and flooring as well. An expert sawyer was the key to a profitable sawmill. The sawyer determined how the log would be cut to obtain the highest grade of lumber. He's the man on the left, controlling the movement of the log carriage. The man riding the carriage is the block setter. Through a system of hand signals, the sawyer told the block setter how far to advance the log. One finger meant one inch, two fingers, two inches, and so on. Actually, it was a little more complicated than that. Since the saw blade was one quarter inch thick, the block setter had to allow for the saw curve. So to cut a one inch board, the log was advanced an inch and a quarter. Usually several sawing operations were taking place at the same time. The men in the background are running an edger which cut the lumber to various widths, while others would cut it to different lengths. The cross ties and lumber were separated as they came out of the mill. Ties were rolled into one pile, lumber into another. many a day for 50 cents from daylight till dark. I don't think you do that, but you go to getting hungry and you might do it. I worked with my dad, helped him there all through the 20s. Well, from 25 on up to, I guess, mid-30s. He ran a mill for the Moss Tie Company. And uh, I helped him. And in uh, 50, I bought a mill of my own. And I sold ties and lumber for the most tie company. And the very best of times back then, uh, you worked 10 hours for $2. That was a going wage. If you could get that, you might work for less. But hardly anybody got over $2 a day for a 10 hours work. They were out of work. They got a claim on a creek somewhere and was trying to get a living out of uh, what little ground they had along the creeks. And uh, when someone came in with a sawmill, why they were ready to go to work. We made it. I don't know how. I don't know how we made it, but we made it. Lots of people in this country then. Man, the woods is full of people. I worked a sawmill on 42 for a dollar and a quarter a day. After me and my wife was married, I think I'd make, I think it'd come to about seven dollars and a half a week. I had a Model T car. Tars wore out on it. But I saved up enough money working for a dollar and a quarter a day to buy me four tars for that Model T.
Ties were loaded onto wagons and hauled to the riverbank and allowed to air dry for about a year so they'd float in the river drive. Lumber was stacked with thin strips of wood separating the layers to speed drying and help prevent decay. The sawmills were located far from railroads, making transportation of the cross ties to the treating plant difficult. The easiest way to move them was by a river drive. Ties were thrown into the small creeks in the headwaters of the rivers and floated downstream to a railroad crossing. The company made the first river drive on the Black River in 1908, and the last one tied up at Clearwater in September 1926. During that time period, ties were floating on some part of the river at all times. The drives began far up the east, middle, and west forks of the Black River, and more ties were added as the raft moved downstream, some 30 to 40 miles to the Missouri Pacific Railroad siding at Clearwater. The drives started about the 1st of June each year. Some of the larger drives contained more than 250,000 ties and took four months to complete. Usually only a mile or two of progress was made each day. The river hogs, or pigs as they were called, worked a 10-hour shift and were paid $1.75 a day plus meals. The men worked, ate, and slept along the river while on a drive and were wet to the skin most of the time. When the drive reached the railroad crossing, men, teams of horses and mules, and wagons would be standing by to pull the ties from the river and carry them to waiting railroad cars. A tie boom, constructed of pilings, wooden timbers, and heavy steel cable, was stretched across the river to stop the ties at the takeout point. About a quarter mile above the boom, wagons were backed into the river for loading ties. Each wagon held 20 to 25 ties. For this particular operation, the company had 40 to 50 teams hauling ties. Many of the Teamsters were independent operators. They supplied their own equipment and teams. Mules were preferred over horses because they could handle the heat of the summer and were less excitable. Their loads were counted and the men were paid according to the amount of ties they hauled to the rail cars. It was hard work following an old mule up and down the hill all day. <laughs> when night comes, you're ready to go to house and go to bed. Gangs of men called shoulder crews loaded the cars. Two men called headers picked up a tie and placed it on a cushioned leather shoulder pad of the carrier. Some of the ties weighed several hundred pounds. Box cars had to be loaded by hand. The springy oak planks looked precarious, but they actually made the loading easier as they bounced the man and his tie up into the car. Each man loaded, on the average, about 200 of the heavy water-soaked ties a day. The ties were pulled from the river with either a chain-driven conveyor or a steam-powered Barnhart loader. The loader could pull ties directly from the river and swing them into awaiting rail cars. Even though the mechanized loaders were being used more, there still was a tremendous amount of manual labor involved in retrieving ties and loading them for shipment to the treating plants. The work was slow, and when the main drive came in, ties could be backed up the river for miles. After 1925, T.J. Moss and other tie producing companies working in the Ozarks agreed to a plan that would help protect fish spawning by halting tie rafting operations during the period from April 15th through June 1st. There was concern that the tie drives disrupted spawning. The railroad brought the loading crews in daily from faraway communities to the work site and returned them at day's end. There were no accommodations for them to stay the night. And it took a lot of men to, to move the amount of timber that they, they were producing.
You never did walk with a tie. You couldn't do it. You had to run with it. Up that board, get that board helping you, you know. And, uh, no, you couldn't just pick one of them up and walk in the car with it. You'd give out in just a little while. Now I was about 17 or 18 years old. I, I was a pretty good sized boy. I weighed around 180. And I loaded ties at wine on this, and the next morning I couldn't get my britches on, couldn't get my pants on. I was stiff and sore. I had to get up and work my sawmill there too, and you'd be all right. The next weekend you had to go back. Yeah, we worked. It wasn't much work, that's the reason. Carried ties for a penny a piece or a cent and a half for two dollars a day or so. Yeah, it was different then. Of course, I guess we didn't know any better and thought we were doing good. During the 18 years the T.J. Moss Tie Company conducted tie drives on the Black River, more than four and a half million ties were floated from Lesterville to Clearwater. That was more than enough to build 1,000 miles of mainline railroad. And more importantly, no one working for the company drowned or was killed while working on a river drive. In building a timber treating plant, one of the essential factors was accessibility to railroads. Not only were the railroads the principal consumers of cross ties, they were also the main and in most cases the only means of transportation. The company's East St. Louis plant was located about a mile south of the city and could serve all of the 23 railroads coming into the St. Louis area. It covered about 70 acres and provided sufficient room to maintain an inventory of one and a half million ties. Entire train loads of cross ties were constantly rolling into the plant from their cutting operations in the Ozarks. The ties were unloaded and carefully stacked for proper seasoning before being treated. Oak ties had already seasoned a year or more before treating. Pine ties, on the other hand, were ready for treatment within four to six months. The plant had two Browning locomotive cranes for loading and unloading ties. They operated under their own power and traveled over standard gauge tracks. Driving metal S-irons into the ends of the ties prevented excessive checks and splits while they were being seasoned. There were two Davenport steam locomotives for moving the trams around the plant. They ran on 24-inch gauge railroad tracks. The company also purchased season ties from independent suppliers. They were unloaded directly from boxcars onto the awaiting trams. After the proper seasoning time, the ties were ready for treatment. The loaded trams were moved from the tie yard into the treating cylinder.
A heavy cable was placed over the lead load of ties. The trams weren't connected, so the cable made it easier to retrieve the string of trams from the chamber after treatment. The cylinders were 150 feet long and 74 inches in diameter, and could hold 700 to 900 ties, depending on the size of the ties. After the chamber was sealed, a vacuum was drawn inside the cylinder, helping pull the moisture from the ties. Then the creosote was added under pressure to force the chemical into the wood pores. After pressure treating for a specific time, the creosote was pumped out and the trams of treated ties were pulled from the cylinder. The ties might have been moved to a concentration area or loaded directly into railroad cars for shipment. As in their woods operation, much of the loading and unloading of ties at the treating plant was done by manual labor. The two browning cranes were also used for loading gondola cars and moving ties around the yard. The 20-ton cranes could load 7,000 ties in a 10-hour day. That was about equal to the efforts of a 20-man loading crew. Often, entire train loads of treated ties were sent to areas where new railroad tracks were being built. There was rapid growth in wood preservation during the early 1900s. In 1912, there were only 87 plants. By 1922, there were 128 wood preserving plants in operation in the entire country. At first, most of the ties used by the railroads were untreated and lasted about five and a half years. During this time period, there was an abundance of tie timber available, but its rapid depletion and the rise in prices of commercial species demanded better methods of treatment to prolong the life of the tie and extend the timber resource. A creosote-treated Moss Tie Company cross tie could typically be expected to give 20 to 40 years of service. Many have lasted over 50 years, as evidenced by dating nails used years ago to indicate the year of installation. The stamp of character brand meant T.J. Moss Tie Company Cross Ties Plus. Plus for the security of their ownership of thousands of acres of standing timber. Plus for a stock of ties always on hand plus for the absolute control of the treating process, plus for a warranty that their product would be delivered as promised, and plus for the pride and ambition of all men who stood behind the brand. While much of the Ozarks land had been stripped of its timber in a span of about 40 years, the T.J. Moss Tie Company maintained ownership of their land and began good forest management practices, including tree planting and fire protection. Those practices continued as ownership of the land passed hands in 1963 to the Kerr-McGee Corporation. Nearly 80,000 acres of this land is now available for public use after the Missouri Department of Conservation purchased it in the early 90s. Although the present forest includes more hardwoods than the pre-settlement pine forest, it stands as a testament to the renewability of the forest resources in the state. Today, the amount of forest land in Missouri is on the rise. Our forests are growing two and a half times faster than they're being harvested. 
Missouri's timber industry provides thousands of jobs and contributes about $3 billion each year to the state's economy. The state of Missouri has more than 14 million acres of forest land. 85% is owned by private landowners. Forests are Missouri's greatest renewable resource. If managed wisely, a healthy forest will keep producing quality trees for years to come, creating tremendous economic, environmental, and social benefits. Thanks for watching.